Nothing is impossible for our Father God. Nothing. Isn't that right, Janice? Nothing is impossible. We've got to take the limits off of him. You know, when we have unbelief, we limit our Father God. Let's not have unbelief. Let's believe that with him all things are possible. And just, I can't even think of the words to say, but possibilities are ours to walk in. All that he has because he's so faithful. And this morning we're celebrating a possibility. Hallelujah. Amen. Because all things are possible. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The rest of you go ahead and um, open your Bibles. We'll, we'll read our foundation text for this teaching we're doing. Uh, we'll go to Luke chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. We've been teaching on the purpose of the baptism or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have not been with us, it is impossible for us to cover all the ground and make all the, uh, and make our case uh, for different things from the scripture uh, over again in a five-minute synopsis. And so, we encourage you to go back. Uh, you can go to, you can go to online to our site of www.fbc.org um, and go to our, uh, our audio tab and look for the streaming audio or you can, you can uh, and, uh, subscribe to our podcast either audio or video. You can catch us on YouTube. And if you've got a Roku box, R-O-K-U, uh, we are on Speak Faith TV. We are have, have a channel there. Dr. Bill's uh, sermons are out there. Ours are out there. Video sermons. Um, and, but I would encourage you to go back and listen to these, this series uh, from the beginning and, and catch up uh, because we just can't keep, you can't cover that much ground over again. Especially when it's been five, six, seven services. You can't cover that kind of ground again uh, and trying to get people caught up. So I, I encourage you, if you've missed those things, go back and listen. You can listen to them in the convenience of your home, put them on your pod, uh, iPod or your MP3 player, download them and, um, and get those things and listen to them way riding to work. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, some of the things we've covered is, you know, is there a difference between being born again and being filled with the Holy Spirit? We've proven from the scriptures there is a difference. We, there's no way we can cover that. that. That's a whole, that's a two-sermon series almost, just to cover that material. And so we encourage you to go back. But for our main text here, it says in Luke chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, And as the people were in expectation, all men mused in their hearts whether John, whether, of John whether he were the Christ or not. John answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I, hallelujah, cometh. Oh, I thank God that one cometh. Amen? Or he came. The latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into that one spirit. Now, John said Jesus was going to baptize us with the Holy Ghost. Corinthians says that the Holy Ghost baptized us into Jesus, so they're not the same thing. Amen. And, and again, I can give you scriptures and passages of scriptures, and we can go. We can go. Up, I can give you enough scripture in five minutes. You'll just have to go. Blah, 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 okay, and just say that's that's so. It can't be the same thing. You know, remember um, Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ. People giving heed to him, both hearing and seeing the miracles which he wrought, and so much that lame were made whole, and and and, 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 and you know, people palsies were made whole, and so forth. And it, and it goes on and says this. And when the the disciples or the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down might lay hands on them that they might be filled with the Holy Ghost for as yet he was fallen on none of them only and this is over in, in the book of Acts chapter 8 down around starting in verse 5 only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus well if you've been if you've received the word of God you've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus guess what you is born again but they sent Peter and John to lay hands on to get them filled with the Holy Ghost because he hadn't fallen on them yet. See, there is a difference between the experiences. Now, there's not two Holy Ghosts, not two Holy Spirits. The Holy Spirit you become acquainted with in the new birth is the same Holy Spirit that you're filled with in the, what is referred to as the infilling of the baptism of the Spirit. John said, now let me say something here. 
about what John, uh, his statement there. He said this because they were looking to John as maybe he were Christ or not. You know, and people are all, this people are hungry for God. People are hungry for the things of God. People are hungry for answers. People are looking for stuff. And, you know, and, and a lot of times they'll begin to interject what uh, things into people or ministries or whatever that aren't really right or true. And it's the responsibility of ministers to stand up and say, I'm not that person. This isn't the way it's supposed to be and correct it and give it the right way. Amen. Amen. You know, but you know, we, we can't be greedy after filthy lucre. Amen. I mean, if you're gonna lose your following because you set it straight and you set the record straight, lose your following. Amen. You know, John the Baptist, I'm not him. He could have had a whole following. He just went out and said, he could have and said, well, look, look at all the minute, look at all the money that's coming into the ministry. Look what we can do for God. I'm telling you, you cannot afford to sell out for money, no matter who you are. And ministers that are listening by internet or YouTube or whatever, you guys make sure you do this right. When people start lifting you up into a place you're not supposed to be, set the record straight. I said, set the record straight. Why? Because it's the people that get hurt when we don't do right. It's the people that get hurt. It's not the, it's not the ministries that get hurt. They get, a, lot, a lot of times they get money and run to the bank and they're living on some island somewhere and the people are hurt. It, we have a responsibility before God as ministers of the gospel. And the reason we say so many things is because we're all over the world. We go into China. We go all over the world with our, our podcasts and so forth. Um, and the people are listening. Ministers are listening. And we cannot afford to let people put us in a place that God didn't put us. And see, the people were looking at John the Baptist as if he were the Christ. They were trying to put him into a place he wasn't he called to. He said, there's one that comes after me that's mightier than me. I'm not even worthy to unloose his shoes. Amen? And he'll baptize you. With and then later on, John the Baptist said this, I must decrease and he must increase. Hallelujah. Are you here? So, that's just a side thought. So, we've been talking about the different purposes or, or, or reasons of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And actually, we haven't really got to those things yet. We've been spent a lot of time on the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the infilling of the Spirit is a different experience than being born again. It's the same Holy Spirit, but in a different experience or different manner or different measure. Talking about uh, what took place when they were filled with the Spirit. Um, if, you'll read your, if you'll read your Bible, in, in the book of Acts, there are five places that people were filled or baptized with the Holy Ghost. Three of those places, it says in scriptures, they spoke with tongues. Two of those places, it was inferred. Now, Paul said that he, he was, you know, when Ananias came in and said, Brother, saw the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And he entering in laid his hands on him, and there fell from his eyes as it were scales. Hallelujah. And, they, and then he rose up, and they, min they ministered to him. Well, they didn't, well, they didn't say he spoke in tongues. You have it over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He said, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than y'all. Now, in the Greek, it says, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than y'all or all of you put together. Now, if you're writing that to the Corinthian church, you is one tongue-talking dude. Because then people, that's all they thought about. And Paul said, I, I speak in tongues more than all of you or all of you put together. And then over in, in, the, in the book of Acts, chapter 8, we were quoting about Philip. It says that when they, and, and that the, um, the Simon the sorcerer saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. He offered them money, saying, give to me this power also, that whosoever I lay my hands, they might be filled with the Holy Ghost. And Peter looked at him and said, O child of the devil, full of all subtlety, thy money perish with thee, for thou hast thought that the gift of God might be purchased with money. Hallelujah. Now, why would a former sorcerer offer money for uh, the power to lay hands on people to get them filled with the Holy Ghost if nothing really cool happened? Amen. Now, you read that in chapter, the eighth chapter of Acts. It's there. Hallelujah. What happened? Well, if I, if I look at all the other places in the, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, they were filled with the Spirit. They spoke in tongues. Paul's inferred that he did because he said he spoke in tongues more than all of them put together. It had to be the same thing that happened over there when, when the, the apostles came down and laid hands on them. Or else a former sorcerer who bewitched, the Bible says that he bewitched the people with sorceries. It's so much so that they say this man has the great power of God. Some of y'all looking at me like you don't believe me. Okay. That's why we say bring your Bible. Turn with me, if you will, to the eighth chapter of the book of Acts in the fifth verse. Then Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ unto them. I quoted a lot of this pretty cool, close anyway. And the people with one accord gave heed unto him, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. 
For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. And many were taken with palsies and were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in the city. I'll tell you the, 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 the gospel, the power of God. God doing things for people brings joy. I said, the Lord doing things for people brings joy. Oh my, I'll tell you, there's no more joy than people be receiving good, good things from God. Amen? Are you here? You gone home. <clears throat> well, I'm telling you, when God starts doing things in people's lives, there's great joy. Amen? Amen. And this, this is a citywide revival going on here. Can you have citywide revivals? I'll tell you something. If you'll go back and study Charles Finney, the great revivalist, he'd go into towns back when, when he was preaching, and every brothel, every pub, everything of, of, of ill repute, and, and, and every, any kind of dive, anything that just was ungodly got shut down. Now, they didn't go out with signs and protest in front of them and say, we bind the spirits that run this brothel in Jesus' name. We get, we get so dumb sometimes. They didn't stand out there with signs and say, you're going to hell if you go in there. They didn't do that. What happened? They preached Christ, got so many people saved, they lost all their business. You can have a revival that shuts down all, all the, 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 the dark places. All the dyes could get shut down by a revival. People get so hungry for God. And let me, let me say this. The reason people do those things, they're, they're governed by their flesh. I said they're governed by their flesh. They're out of contact with God. You start having revivals and you start having moves of the Spirit of God in places where people's spirits are, are, are made alive unto God and they get in contact with God with their spirits, not through religion, not through um, uh, um, liturgies, not through, you know, responsive readings, but their spirits are in communion with the Father of spirits, spirit to spirit, glory to God. And I'm telling you, you won't have to go and protest against the abortion clinics. Because the women won't be getting pregnant. Are you here? Y'all here? We, we waste so much time doing dumb stuff. This form a, 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 a life link. So we all stand outside, sing kumbaya, hook arms, and we're going we're gonna to let everybody know we're against abortion. Why don't you just get in your prayer closet and pray, pull heaven down and pull some power down and get a revival going on in the city so that young ladies are full of God and want to serve God and they're chaste and keep their, they keep their lifestyle right with the Lord because they're serving the Lord instead of standing outside some clinic trying to protest everything. Amen. Blowing clinics up don't help. Amen. Now, I am adamantly against abortion. It's evil. Amen. But I'm, I'm, for, I'm for dealing with things in a way that have power and have success. Amen? Amen. Are y'all here? You've gone home. Amen. Stand outside, whatever those, so there's on Wendover. You know, if you go over to Crunchy Barbecue, they got one of them nasty places. I mean, every time, every time my wife rides by there, the hodar goes off. It's a joke. Come on. <laughs> you know, my wife's, my wives are equipped with hodar for their, for their sons. I can tell you, it just goes off. I mean, beep, 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 I'm telling you. Hallelujah. You know, you don't need to go there and protest and say, you, you're evil, this place is nasty or whatever, you know, a bunch of skanks going in and out. I mean, these nasty old men going, so you don't need to do that. Why don't we have a revival? Why don't we take that same energy and get into our prayer closets and believe God for revival? The reason I'm saying that is, remember we talked about Finney would go in and have a revival? What people don't, most people don't know is, Finney had a partner in ministry who would go to the cities about three weeks before he got there and, for, and get a hotel room and lock himself in the room and for three weeks would just pray for revival in that city. Amen. When Finney showed up, he went to the next town they were going to. Now, everybody thought Finney was the great preacher, but they, no, let's, let me say something. He was a great preacher, but the great preaching came on the heels of, a, of, a, of an unknown, well, not really unknown, it's known who he is, but, you know, of a man who spent his time in prayer and was never seen and didn't write the books. And we don't have books written about him. We have books written about Finney. But it was the prayer that preceded, that opened the door and set the atmosphere for the revival. 
And let me say this. See, we need to get filled with the Holy Ghost and stay full of the Holy Ghost and pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen? So that we can pray, pray revivals in and pray things in that get the job done instead of trying to revert to fleshly means of, of doing things because the fleshly means don't do anything. I mean, it's like a bunch of college kids out on the campus that stand there, you know, singing, I, I want to, holding up a Coca-Cola and saying, I want to teach the whole world to sing in perfect harmony. Y'all remember those, those old hippie commercials from the 70s? I was, in, I was a 70s high school student. I had long hair. You know, we, you know, we thought it was cool to stand out there in tie-dye and bell bottoms and tank tops and halters and all that kind of stuff for the girls and, and hold Coca-Cola on a heel of flowers and sing, I want to teach the whole world to sing. We thought we were doing something. We were. We were making more money for Coca-Cola. The, uh, and, they were, and they were all anti-capitalists. Remember that? They were all against the establishment. And they're drinking Coke, helping Coke get richer. We thought that we just thought peace, man. You know, we just need peace. Uh, we thought we were doing something. We thought we were really making a difference. The sit-ins on the campuses. Making a difference. Are you here? It didn't end the war any sooner. The college kids marches on campus didn't end the Vietnam War any sooner. Y'all hear you going home. That wasn't why it ended. Why it ended was we weren't, we weren't willing to pay the price to win. That went over good. Anyway, we could get into, we could just go meddling on that kind of stuff, couldn't we? You're not going to make a difference doing it the way the world does it. We need to be so full of God and so full of the things of God and filled with God that we can hear from heaven, just like Philip did. He went down to Samaria and preached Christ, amen? And they had a citywide revival. There was great joy in the city. That's how I got off on all that. We need to have great joy in Greensboro and High Point and Winston-Salem and the entire Piedmont Triad. Hallelujah. Because of a visitation of God on this area, praise God. But it's only going to be brought about by the church, hallelujah, being full of the Holy Ghost and faith and getting the job done. There was great joy in the city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city, same city, what if I say same city, used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out to himself with some great one. You know, there are people always running around trying to say, say I'm, this is God. You know, a lot of times you don't have to say this is God. If it's really God, you don't have to say it. Everybody figures that out. It's the ones trying to convince you that it's God when you're not sure that you usually have to wonder about. If God's in something, you, don't, you don't really don't need a bunch of advertising. It's like people go around all the time saying, I'm an I'm apostle or prophet so-and-so. If you're really an apostle or prophet, people figure it out. Amen. Are you here? You gone home? Three, three of you here, two of you gone home, three of you don't care. Okay. To whom all gave heed, verse 10, from the least to the greatest, this man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched him with sorcerers. I am telling you, you can get so convinced that something is God, and something is right, and something is done, and you've been bewitched the whole time. Because you don't know, what's that? That's carnality. You haven't been with God long enough or haven't spent enough time with God to know the difference between God's voice and the devil's voice, between God's works and the devil's works. And you can be, he said he bewitched the entire city. If you'd gone into the city before Philip got there and said, man, I need to get in contact with somebody who knows how to get a hold of God, they would have sent you to Simon's house. I, I, man, I heard that. WD-40 is in the back of the audio. You go spray it in your head there and get those rusty gears loosened up. Because I just heard them start going, ee! Yeah, if you got in there before Philip got there, they'll send you to Simon's house. But then when somebody came down and really was full of God, full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and started having miracle signs and wonders happening that were real, that glorified God and not the man. Hallelujah. They realized they'd been bewitched. Hallelujah. But when they believed Philip preaching the things of the concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. 
And he was baptized and continued with Philip, wondering and beholding the miracles and signs which were done. You know, listen, he, he got to see something he had never seen before. He had, he had used sorceries and bewitched the people. Now he's seeing, seeing God. And listen, you, you, let me say something. People who use sorceries and bewitch the people do it for per, per personal gain and manipulation and control. They want to control everything. They want to gain things out of it. Are you here? You go home. Those who are serving God do it to help, for the, to help people and to glorify God. And can receive no honor unto themselves. Amen. Brother Hagin used to say that he said people would go out and um, go out. He said, people would not lie on me. And say, say that, that, that Hagen fella healed me the other night over in that church service. He said, they went out and lied on him. He said, I couldn't heal a gnat. People went out and lied on you. That, that, you know, Pastor had laid hands on me. I, Pastor had healed me. I couldn't heal you. I couldn't heal you if you held a machine gun in my head and said, I'll blow your brains if you don't heal that person. I can't heal anybody. And there were vessels through which God flows, but it's not the person. I said, it's not the person. Amen. Who gets all the God gets all the glory. Jesus is the healer. Jesus bore our sickness and carried our diseases. I can't, no one I can save you. I can't save you. But people, people say stuff and then people get to believe in stuff and get their believing wrong. And then ministers don't straighten it out and then it gets messed up. See? Now, we are honest with you, we're people, and, and sometimes people's pride gets involved, and then they'll start enjoying the praise and the glory. I'll tell you, you can't, you can't take God's glory. He'll get you for that now. Especially if you're a minister, you better watch, you better watch this place if, you're, if you start taking God's glory. He said he'll share his glory with no man. Well, I don't, I don't want to be on the back side of that scripture, do you? Do you, anybody here want to be on the wrong side of that scripture? <laughs> if he says, I won't share my glory with any man, then I'm not going to share my glory. I'm not going to be involved in trying to take it either. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But they believed, and then Simon himself believed, and was baptized, and continued beholding those miracles and signs which were done. Now the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. What did Peter say over in his, his epistle? I believe uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, and I could be wrong. It says, it's either that or 2 Peter. It says this, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Amen. I said, the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now here it says they received the Word of God. Peter said that they were, that were born again by the Word of God. So if they received the Word, they were born of the Word. They're born again. Amen. Are y'all here? You're going home? They sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, they might receive the Holy Ghost. Well, they've already received the Word of God. For as yet he was fallen on none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now listen, they've received the Word of God, they've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, they're saved as you can get. But yet they sent Peter and John down there to lay hands on them to get them filled with the Holy Ghost. Then they laid their hands on them. They received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Now let's stop. Now remember we've already told you the three other places in the book of Acts that said they were filled with the Spirit. They said they spoke with tongues. And we're not going to cover those. And then Paul, Ananias came and laid hands on him that he might receive his sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Then not say he spoke with tongues, but in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul said, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than y'all, and I can only uh, go by what the other scripture says. Then the way they were filled, they spoke. So I'm having to assume that if Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues, because he said he did, then it was at the same time everybody else got it when they got filled with the Holy Ghost. Now something happened right here so powerful that Simon, the former sorcerer, remember he bewitched the people? And now he's caught up, and he's watching all these miracles. He's following them, man, every step of the way. Now, I'm going to tell you, so if I walk over to Brother Benny and go, be filled with the Holy Ghost, lay hands on him, and he goes, thank you, and walks off. If you're a former sorcerer, you're not offering money for that. Amen. If he lifts his hands and say, glory to God, God's good, I got the Holy Ghost, you wouldn't offer money for that. Something so supernatural, something so different, something so uh, miraculous took place at that time that a former sorcerer who knew how to use sorceries and bewitchings wanted to pay money to get that power. Now I present to you, since the other three places in the book of Acts said they spoke with tongues, <coughs> since Paul is inferred because he said later he did, then it's the same thing. They spoke in, in tongues. Amen. As it's Acts chapter 2 for us, and they were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I present to you that it's the same thing. How else he wouldn't offer them money. 
I've also shown you this one passage of Scripture shows you that the new birth and the baptism or the infilling of the Holy Spirit are not the same experience. Can't be. I said they can't be. Because we know they received the Word of God, they were baptized in water, and then they sent Peter and John down there to get them filled with the Holy Ghost. Can't be the same experience. No, baptism or the infilling of the Holy Spirit is subsequent to the new birth. Hallelujah. Peter, and then, uh, uh, and saying, give to me who, uh, power, I'm sorry, verse 19, saying, give me this power to whomsoever I lay my hands, he might receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter said, thou money perish with thee, because thou thought that the gift of God might be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Now the word matter there in the Greek, and I'm, I always get this, it's either, it's, it's logos. I always try, I get Raymond and Logos mixed up here because I, you know, I don't have it written down. I should write my Bible, so always when I teach this, I do it right. But it, the, the word means discourse. And you, know, you understand this Greek words have many meanings, and you have to take them in their context. And if you don't take them in the right context, you come up with super stuff. Hello. Now, like, there's people that are teaching now that, you know, grace is God's undeserved, unmerited favor. Now, let me say this. Um, that is a definition that man, man has made. If you'll go back and study, grace has more power and more meaning than just undeserved, unmerited favor. Because there are scriptures, you can't put that definition in there and it makes sense. If you translate it and read it and go, certain scriptures and read God's unmerited and undeserved favor for the word grace, you'll go, that scripture makes no sense. But if you'll study in context the words, and you, you understand Greek is a very powerful, this particular Koine Greek, this particular time of the Greek language, extremely powerful in its, its broadness of its definitions and meanings of its words. And, and of course, King James, is, or many, as many of our translations are, are word-for-word -word translations. So they try to look for a word to try to best describe the full flavors, and it's hard to do. English is not as powerful as Greek was. It just isn't. We have to take 14 adjectives sometimes to describe what they're saying. Uh, the word charity in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, is the Greek word agape. Now, you, cannot tra you can't translate that word for word for what it really means. Because agape means unconditional love, the unconditional love that God has and is. It is God's love. It is unconditional love. It is not giving to the united way. But that word charity was used by the King James translators because at that time, for a rich person to give to a peon, that was, under, that, that was uh, you know, <laughs> undeserved or unmerited or uh, unconditional. They would give, they, you know, because they didn't do that. And so that word was used, but it didn't co fully convey the full meaning of it. Well, here this word, uh, matter, is really, if you, if in the Greek full explanation, it is this matter of utterance. It is utterance. If you go study it out and, and, and take some time and, some, and, and, get, and set it right, it says so you have neither lot nor part in this matter. Well, see, you've got to use word for word because that's how they did it. But it is matter of utterance. What kind of utterance? Same utterance you had everywhere else. They spoke in tongues. I said they spoke in tongues. Well, that's, that's, what, you know, that's how they got filled with the Holy Ghost. So the initial sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit was they spoke in other tongues. Now we can, we can go through and show you that through the script, throughout the book of Acts. And then somebody comes back along and says, well, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, you know, the, the, there will come a day when that which is perfect has come. Tongues shall cease. Knowledge shall cease. Um, uh, something else shall cease. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13 would not hurt me. Just turn over there. Glory to God. It says, charity never fails, verse 8, but whether there be prophecies, they'll cease. Or they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. Now, I'm going to say something here. I love this. You got people who use this passage of Scripture to run around and tell everybody that tongues are no longer here because perfect has come and therefore they cease. But what it says here is prophecies will fail. Amen. Are you here? Are you here? Tongues shall cease, knowledge shall vanish away. Verse 9 says, we know in part knowledge, we prophesy in part, and it don't say anything about tongues being in part, does it? And then it goes on and says this, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away. So, 
to follow the logic of the people who use this particular passage of Scripture to support the position that tongues have ceased, really you'd have to say that prophecy and knowledge have passed away and not tongues because it didn't say the tongues were part. It only said that that which is in part shall be done away. That's what my Bible says. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, we see through a glass darkly. But I know I'm covering some things from last week. But it, it, we're kind of tying back in here. But then, face to face. Now, I now I know in part. But then, shall I know even also as I am known now, if you'll go over to John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, When we, he shall appear, we shall, see, we shall be as he is, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Paul, you know, people, people argue that when Paul said, when that which is perfect has come, that it was a canon of scripture. Uh, I, support, I, I submit to you that 1 John 3, 1 is really the return of the Lord. He said, now, now, and let me say something here. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. If anybody was a walking Bible, it was Paul. Hello? He was called up into the third heaven and heard things unlawful to be uttered. Y'all hear you go home. He wasn't talking about canonicity of Scripture when he said, when that which is perfect is come. Because let me ask you, how many know him right now the way he knows you? Let me just raise your hand. If you know, if you know Jesus in the, in the complete, full extent that he knows you, raise your hand. Well, Paul said, when that day comes, you will. He said, when that which is perfect is coming. Verse 12, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. How many know him and know the things of God the way he knows you? But you will. I said you will. When he returns and your corruption puts on incorruption, your morals will put on immortality, and you're changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, and you're called up in the air, so shall, so shall you ever be with the Lord. Then you'll know even as you're known in the full measure. Paul said, talking about a different day. He was not talking about 400 years later when some guys got together in some council and sat down and said, this is canonicity, and everything stopped. Some of the dumbest theology, theological ideas men have come up with, inspired by the devil. Oh, it all happened, it all ceased the day the last apostle died. That's the dumbest, I think we got, and you think, where did you come up with that one? Can you give me scripture that, that tongues, miracles, signs, wonders, the power of God, the demonstrations of God are going to cease the day the last apostle dies? Give me a scripture. Just give me one. Nope. <laughs> Where'd they get it from? They just made it up. Somebody just made it up. Why? Doctrines of devils. Hello? I mean, you can almost hear Darth Vader back there helping him out. <laughs> I love to do that. I just, I get this big kick out of it. I just think it's the coolest thing. Get to do my Darth Vader thing. They just made it up. And people believed it. They all passed away the day last apostle died. Why? Do, how can we believe that? Well, that's the apostolic age. It ended and all that stuff. Now, did you know Jesus said in the, in, in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Mark that these signs shall follow them? Look, turn over there. Look over there. Turn, turn over your Bible in Mark 16. If you don't have your Bible, put it up for me today. Come on, guys. If you, if you can grab it real quick and put it up. Yeah. Go ye in all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. He did not say these signs shall follow the first century apostles. He said these signs shall follow them that what? Believe. They shall speak with new tongues. 
All right, they'll cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Actually, the word cast out devils in the Greek says exercise authority over demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any other thing, it shall not harm them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Some guy one day said, that, that speaking with new tongues is, if they used to cuss, they'll stop cussing. Now, my question back to that is, if you didn't cuss, do you start? Hello? Yeah, if you used to cuss, you'll say, it, said that, 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 that didn't say that the ones that used to cuss will stop and get a new tongue. It said, these signs will follow them that believe. They'll speak with new tongues. Now, if you didn't cuss, then you got to start because the guys who did cuss are stopping. See, you know, you see, that's just stuff people make up. People just make stuff up. And it sounds so good. But they put stuff on television. They just make up. They run these five-minute infomercials. And for $19.99, you can get that thing. But if you call in the next 30 minutes, we'll double the order. Just pay separate shipping and handling. Hello? Y'all seen it, hadn't you? And the first 15 callers, we're going to quadruple the order. You get four magic whatevers for $19.99 plus $8 shipping and handling for every one of them. <laughs> Hello, or $9.99 shipping and handling. Y'all here? And 30-day money-back guarantee. Turn it back 30 days and we'll refund you everything but the shipping and handling. Why? Because the stuff costs about what the shipping and handling was. They're not going to lose any money. Hello. And, and people theologically have made stuff up and sold it to the church for $19.99. And they all believed it. These signs shall follow them that didn't say a thing about apostles, didn't say anything about prophets, didn't say anything about Peter, James, and John, the inner three. It, <coughs> it said these signs shall follow them that believe. And look what the first thing is in my name. And then it talks about exercising authority over demons, the supernatural. Speaking with new tongues, that is supernatural. Amen. Taking up serpents. And you listen, you know, listen. You don't go and put rattlesnakes in a basket on the platform and run up there and grab it and dance around the church with it. First, it's ungodly. God didn't say that. How do you know that's ungodly? Because when the devil tried to get Jesus to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple, he said it's, and Satan quoted the scripture. He said, for it is written, the angel shall bear thee up, lest thou dash a foot against the stone. And Jesus said, it's also written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Angels bearing you up was accidental falling or whatever. It had nothing to do with throwing yourself off the top of a mountain and saying, catch me if you can, Lord. Hello? He said here you'll take up serpents. And the devil comes and people say, if you've really got faith, you can take up serpents and dance with them. I love that story of, Win, uh, uh, of Wendy Bagwell and the Sunlighters. He went up to old, uh, old church, uh, church up in West Virginia. He said they had to drop drop cords two miles to get power to the building. Now, so I thought it's an exaggeration. They would have fried everything. But, it was, but he said they got up on the platform. There's some baskets there. He looked at the pastor and said, What's up? what are they? He said, you'll, you'll find out. And that service got to go, and they got to rocking and got to, got to getting, getting with it. You know, thought they were in the spirit. And this woman ran up and threw the top off one of them baskets and pulled out a rattlesnake and started dancing with it. He turned to that pastor and said, where's the back door? He said, we don't have one. He looked at the pastor again and said, where do you want it? He's getting ready to cut out of there, man. Now, the scripture says, can we get to the next verse 18? It says, they'll take up serpents. That doesn't mean you go, go dance around with rattlesnakes in church trying to prove you've got faith. They had a pastor's wife recently in the past two years. They got bit in the face by a rattlesnake and died. Guess you didn't have enough faith. No, he got warmed up. Because they don't tell everybody, they put them in the refrigerator and get them cold. And so the snakes are lethargic and they can't, they can't inject venom when their body temperature is below 50 degrees. And so they get them cold. And then, so the pastor went right there and grab it and dance with it. The boy done with, and certain people dance with it and think, oh man, baby, look at how much faith he's got and get everybody else doing it. That snake gets warm and gets irritated. <laughs> Hello? And later on, by the time he gets warm and irritated, he's ready to bite somebody. Y'all here, you've gone home. Now, taking up serpents is like Paul on the island of Miletus. When he was putting wood on the fire, a serpent came out and laid it, latched on him and bit him. And they all, it was a poisonous serpent. And they all were sitting around waiting for him to die. He didn't die. And so they began, they, they began to think, you know, he was God or something. He had to straighten them out. But, you know, that was what that was. It was supernatural deliverance from an act. He didn't, he didn't 
handle the snake. It got him unexpectedly. It was an accident. Drinking the deadly things. You don't go drink arsenic to prove you got faith. If you drink arsenic, make sure you have everything signed and filled out before you do. So I can do your funeral right. But if you accidentally are poisoned or somebody was deliberately poisoned and you didn't know it, you can be, you can be healed and covered and protected. That's supernatural. Amen. Laying hands on the sick and then recovering is supernatural. Speaking in tongues is not a natural stop cussing thing. Amen. The new birth should take care of that alone. The fact that you're born again, the life of God's in you should change the nature and the way you want to talk. Y'all hear? No, it's, super, it's just a supernatural. There's everything else up here. And it said these signs shall follow them that believe. This is something that believers should be walking in. These are things that the believers should be experiencing, having take place in their life. Because it's thoroughly scriptural. You can get most of these same people who say it's all passed away to agree with you that it was at one time it was in the church. And it was part of the church and part of the operation of the church. They just don't believe it's for today. Well, why? Because somebody told them something that wasn't in the Bible and they believed it. And they teach it down in their Bible schools. My wife worked with somebody and they, and they came in one day and their, their husband is a minister and um, had gone to a theological cemetery, um, seminary and um, you know, where, they, where they kill you and take all the life and knowledge and wisdom and, and desire for God out of you. A lot of our, th a lot of our th seminaries have become those things. And the first thing they told them, the first day they were there, is no such thing as the devil. Poor Jesus. He didn't know when the devil was tempting him that he wasn't really the devil. Are you here? You, you think, how dumb can people be? The Bible said the devil took him to the pinnacle. How did he get up there? The devil didn't take him. The devil's not real. How did he get up on the pinnacle of the temple? He was delusional because he had been fasted for. Now, wait a second now. See, this, this is the whole purpose of do doctrines of devils and false teachings <clears throat> is to undermine the, the authority, the reality of Jesus Christ being God manifest in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Oh, there's no such thing as a real devil. Well, the Bible says that the devil took him to the pinnacle of the temple. The devil appeared to him and asked him to turn his stones into bread. Hello? Took him to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. And said, all this is delivered unto me and I can deliver it unto you if you'll just bow down and worship me. Jesus said, it's written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou worship. Well, who was he talking to if there's no real thing, real devil? He went on an acid trip, you know, and, and hallucinating. Are you here? But they teach it. I mean, I'm not going to call the name of the denomination, but it's a main line. It's not, it's not even some of your liberal. It's a main line, what would typically be considered more of a conservative type denomination. There's no such thing as a devil. My, 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 my. The writers of the Gospels, writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, did not know that when Jesus was ha having all those things happen, that they were just hallucinogenics. There was no real devil there. No, there's a real devil. There's real supernatural things in the kingdom of heaven. Speaking in tongues is, is in the Bible. We got two full chapters dedicated to spiritual gifts and tongues and, and the proper operation of those in the church, in the, Bible, in the New Testament. Yet people say that, you know, it's amazing that you put in canon chapters of the Bible to deal with things that once you got the canon, were no longer relevant according to some people. So I'm arguing my case. The church needs to be a supernatural church. The Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit is of God. Speaking in tongues is of God. It's not weird. You're not crazy. You're not a lunatic. It's happened throughout the Bible. Now, it's a spiritual matter coming out of the spirit of man where he's communing with spirit, the spirit to the father of spirits. It's not of the head. We're so carnally trained. Let me say this church. We've got to become more spirit trained and spirit minded than we are soul emotion minded and trained. Don't educate your mind at the expense of your spirit. It's okay to educate the mind. I'm not against education. We, we are an educated family. I have two girls with BAs. Um, my wife has a, and I have masters. If I write my dissertation I have a doctorate. <laughs> If I write my dissertation. Anybody want to write it for me? <laughs> yeah. 
It's that 150 page thing is just kind of like, you know, man, I just don't want to sit down and do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. I can do it, but I just don't want to do it. You know what I'm saying? Anybody with me? Understand? You know, writing 100. Nathan, write it for me. That's my buddy. All right. Thank you, son. Appreciate it. He's got my back. Nobody's going to write it for me. I'll have to write it myself. You know, I'm not against education, but I don't believe in educating your mind at the expense of your spirit. We need to be spending our time training our spirit. Let me say this. That, that's just not the education. That's in relationships. That's in people, uh, talking with people. That's in uh, what you're feeding your mind on. All those things can be at the expense of your spirit. We need to feed our spirits. Our spirits. How do we do that? Well, J Jude says in verse 20, build up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Are you here? Paul writes in Ephesians, the first, fifth chapter, the 18th verse, Be ye being filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. We covered this last week. Paul said that with his spirit he, he prays. Amen. Amen. And, and two verses before that it said, over in chapter 14, he said that he that prayeth in an unknown tongue, uh, amen, prays in the spirit. When he pray, anyone that prays in the spirit prays with an unknown tongue. Amen. And then he comes down two verses later and says, what, what am I going to do then? I'm going to pray with the Spirit and pray with the understanding. Now, according to Paul, praying in the Spirit, verse 14, I mean, chapter 14, for if I not, verse 14 of chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. But my understanding is unfruitful. Why? Because you're, you're speaking in an unknown tongue, your mind's not getting anything out of it. Paul comes down a couple verses later and says, what am I going to do then? Now, that was King Jimmy. King Jimmy said, what is it then? That's what am I going to do? He says, I will pray with the Spirit. Two verses before, he said, or, uh, he said well, actually one, one verse before, he says, when I pray in another tongue, my spirit prays. What am I going to do? I'm going to pray with my spirit and I'm going to pray with my understanding. Oh, what's your understanding? If you're German, you, speak, you, you, you pray in Deutsch. Sprechen Sie Deutsch. You pray in German. If you're English, you pray in English. That's your understanding. If you're Spanish, you pray in Espanol. If you're French, you pray in Francais. Italiano. Whatever your language is, that's, that's praying with your understanding. But praying with your spirit, Paul says, is an unknown tongue. Why? Because your mind doesn't get it. So he said, well, I'm going to do both of them. And that's what Paul said. I said, Paul said that. I'll sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding also. So here in these two verses here, we have Paul telling us that praying in the Spirit is praying in tongues. And the great apostle of the church, we, we consider Paul the greatest apostle because he wrote so much of the New Testament, says that he's going to do both praying in the Spirit, praying with an unknown tongue. You can't, you can't get anything outside of that. One person said this means you're praying with more oomph, with more fervor. Praying in the Spirit is praying with more oomph. Uh, one preacher said more, I can't even remember the word he used, sp spaniconum or something. I mean, it must be some colloquial expression where he was from. I mean, just more, you know, spazzed, more oomph, more, you know, fervor. Well, that's not what Paul said. Paul didn't say when I pray, with, when I pray in an unknown tongue, I'm praying with more oomph. Or he didn't say when I pray with oomph, I'm praying in the Spirit. He said if I speak in an unknown tongue, I'm praying in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. So what am I going to do? Paul said he, his rhetorical question. Paul will always use rhetorical questions. You read his writings, he's always making, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's rhetorical. Because the obvious answer is no. Hello? Well, here he says, what is it then? Or what am I going to do? I'm going to pray both with the Spirit in tongues and with the understanding of my natural language. Amen. Why? So both his Spirit and his mind are fruitful. That's what that's the purpose. Amen. So, part, one of the one of the purposes of being filled with the Spirit, and the Jude says, you pray, you pray, build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Well, Paul said praying in the Holy Ghost was praying in tongues. Jude, Jude says it builds your faith. It doesn't, it doesn't create faith, it builds faith. Did you know there's a difference? Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Jude says you build your faith or build up on your faith. It didn't say you create faith. Faith's created from the Word of God. You, you energize your faith by praying in, praying in the Spirit, praying in the Holy Ghost. So one of the biggest purposes of praying in the Spirit is to build up on your most holy faith. Amen? Now, again, I'll only have to get back to you next week. 
We're going to have to get into Isaiah where it says, with, with, with stammering lips and a known tongue will I speak unto the people. Wherewith they said unto the weary, this is the, this is the rest. Wherewith you shall cause the weary to rest. Amen. There's refreshing that comes to the spirit of man by praying in the spirit. God wants to refresh your spirit, man. God wants your spirit, man, energized and refreshed. Amen. Charged up. Now, Jude, where it says in Jude 20, but ye, ye beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, today in modern vernacular, that Greek word could be translated to charge like a battery. Anybody ever had a dead battery? Ever had your phone go, beep, beep, beep. You look down there, low battery, bloop. What do you got to do to it? You got to go hook it up. And what? Charge it. I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of Christians running around with a warning sign on their spirit. Low battery. I said low battery. You're still functioning, but not well and not for long. You're about to get turned off. And you need to go charge yourself up. What well, Jude says, you do it by praying in the Holy Ghost. You'll build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. What happens in that place? What happens when you start building yourself up? What happens when, when your spirit man begins to get charged up? You begin to be more spirit conscious than you are soul or emotion conscious. And the soul and emotion of man will lead and it will guide you. Are you here or you gone home? And if you don't, if you're not operating out of the spirit, you're operating out of the soul, you can get yourself in trouble. Israel got a king, not because God wanted them, but because their flesh dominated them. I've seen Christians go certain directions in life because they prayed something out and they desired something. They prayed it out, out of their soul and not out of their spirit. And it led them over and got them in trouble and God let them have it even though it wasn't his will. Hello. I've had people leave this church because they prayed themselves right out of it. They wanted something, prayed about it. God finally said, okay. As a matter of fact, one time somebody came to me and they had talked about leaving a couple of times before to go do something different. And I said, well, you know, I really believe this is, you know, but you know, the, the Lord said, shut up, tell them to go ahead. And I said, okay, be blessed. Go, go your way. I prayed the self that way. You can't, you got to, we got we to learn to pray in the spirit. Come out of our human spirits in communion with God, out of the Holy Ghost, and not pray out our will, but pray out His will. Ascertain the will of God, then pray that way. Don't bring God your will and get Him to hook up with it. He'll let you do what you want to do. I said, He'll let you do what you want to do. Oh, but the cost. There's a price to pay for going your way. Oh, it's so much better just, just to get God's way. It's better to go the way of God. I said it's better to go the way of God. Oh, my, 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 my. Don't bring God something and say, Lord, bless my mess. Just say, Lord, what is your will? And go his way. Hearken unto the voice of the Lord. Hearken unto the voice of the Lord. Pray out what God says, not what you want. God's way is always blessed already. It's always easier to work with what's blessed instead of what you want. I've seen people do it. And here's the thing. They think it's good. They think they're happy. They think they're blessed. And they're walking way below what the Lord had for them. Right now, I can, I can tell you they're walking way below what the Lord had for them. Oh, my. There's just, there's, listen, I want God's highest. I want God's best. And we can pray that way. We can pray in the Holy Ghost and get the wisdom from heaven. Hallelujah. In our spirits and not in our minds. Glory to God. And yield and submit to the will of God and the mind of God and the counsel of God. And go the way of God. Oh, and walk in a high place. I said walk in a high place. I've seen ministers miss it. Because they weren't happy somewhere. They weren't happy with how many people they had. They weren't happy with, you know, what they were doing. And they, and they left. They left and went and did something else. And it cost them. Oftentimes it cost them their marriage. I've seen them cost more marriages over getting out of the will of God than anything. Yeah. I mean, you mean it'll cost you your marriage? It can. You get out of the will of God, you set yourself in a bad place. Well, I want to do this. One minister cost him his life back in the, back in the 50s, late 50s, come into the 60s. 
He, he couldn't teach his way out of a wet paper bag, but he had, he, he had gifts of healings that, uh, that were phenomenal. Could preach and minister in the gifts of healings. They said they could line 10 blind people up in front of him. He walked down the line. Nine out of 10 got healed instantly every time. He started teaching. And his teaching was because he couldn't teach. He wouldn't get to teach. He wasn't called to teach. He started teaching stuff to God. They even called it by his last name. They called that doctrine. He started teaching by his last name. And he started teaching stuff that was off. And somebody came to him and said, the spiritual mentor, older in the Lord. He said, Brother So-and-so, you're not called to teach? He said, yeah, I know it, but I want to. He died early. Out of the will of God. Doing what he wanted to do. Oh, it doesn't cost to obey God, it pays. Amen? How do we, find, we ascertain the will of God in those places of, of spiritual prayer. Where we lay aside our will, our wants, our desires, our thinking, our emotions. And we get in communion with the Spirit of God, spirit to spirit. Hallelujah. And yield and submit to the counsel and mind of God. Oh, 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 it pays. It pays. It pays. I said it pays. It pays to obey God. It pays to be in that place where God's speaking to your heart and you know God's speaking to your heart and you're obeying what God said. Although everything else said you want to do something different. I've had times I wanted to leave here. I just have times I wanted to pack up and move. I heard one preacher say one time that he told his wife, if I didn't know the Lord told me to come to this church and take this church, I'd get up in the middle of the night, I'd pack all of our stuff, put it in the truck and drive off. They'd come over the next morning, I'd be gone. Oh, there's times you want to do what you want to do. But you have to obey God. You have to submit to God. Oh, but the, co the price that you pay to obey God is far, out, is far outweighed. It's far outweighed by the rewards of obedience. Walking in the plan of God. You ascertain that in the spirit. You're not going to get it out of your emotion. Your emotion is going to want to do what it wants to do. And if you pray things out a certain way and you keep pushing that way, God will let you go. And you'll miss God. I don't want to miss God. I don't want to miss the ways of God. I don't want to miss the blessings of God. I don't want to wake up, find out one day I've lived my whole life and did not know that God has something better for me. Get to heaven, walk in the doors, and the Lord say, well, you could have had this, but you chose that because you wouldn't listen to me. And see all that you could have had had you obeyed God. We want to walk in the ways of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. Thank you for the goodnesses and mercies of God. Thank you that we can pray in the Spirit and commune with you spirit to spirit. That our spirits can have a, com a divine communication with you in such a way. Oh my, 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 my. That it causes us to walk in a different dimension and a different place in, the, in spiritual matters and spiritual things. So that we're led of the Spirit of the Spirit, directed of the Spirit, and the blessings that come upon us because of it are great and mighty in Jesus' name. Help each one of us to see with clarity what your Word teaches, to be filled to full with the Holy Ghost, to be able to pray in the Spirit daily, regularly, so that our spirits are charged and edified and built up. We thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.